Hello, everybody. Hi. Welcome to seminar. So this is exciting because this is the first time this semester that we've all been together as an entire department. So you've probably had your seminar classes and your separate class years, but this is the best, I think, because we can all be together as one department. Um, so we will meet like this several times throughout the semester um, to hear someone from outside our campus come and talk to us about their expertise. And uh, today we have Emily Arsenal from Bates College, and I'll introduce her in a second. But I just wanted to remind everybody, or if you're freshmen, tell you for the first time that we stream this live. So we do have a camera, a couple cameras, and we use the mics so that people who are watching on YouTube can um, hear what we're saying. So at the end, we'll have some time for questions, and we'll be bringing the mic around to anybody who has a question so that um, those people online can hear you. Um, before I introduce Emily, do any of the Ocean Studies faculty have any announcements to make? I have an announcement. Um, for the first year students, thank you for those of you who came down and introduced yourself to me. Um, if you weren't on my list or you haven't introduced yourself to me and I haven't checked you off yet, please make sure you do that at the end of, at the end of this seminar so you can get credit for being here. Are there any other announcements? All right. Well, let me give you some background on Emily. Uh, Emily studied environmental science and biology at Colby College, so in our nice little home state. Uh, she graduated in 2014, and she received a master's and a PhD degree in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Kansas. And at the University of Kansas, her research focused on fish food webs in grassland rivers. She's currently a postdoctoral research associate at Bates College in Lewiston, and she has been working on an NSF EPSCOR funded lake water quality monitoring uh, project using new technologies with Dr. Holly Ewing and others at Bates and potentially beyond. So uh, let's welcome Emily and hear about what she's been working on. this works. Can you hear me? Okay, awesome. Um, hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be at the coast today and on your beautiful campus. Um, so what can robots reveal? Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler alert um, and say that robots actually can really advance our understanding of lake ecosystems. And I'll tell you why. So before I start, I'd really like to acknowledge that everything I'm about to share with you has been a result of tons of effort by every member of this really large team. We have roboticists who designed the autonomous surface vehicle that I'm gonna tell you about in our research. Limnologists at multiple institutions who have an enormous amount of long-term knowledge about our study lakes and a whole bunch of students who were absolutely instrumental in helping deploy the robot on dozens of field days. And I'd also like to thank the funding sources and partners who have made all of this possible. So those of us who spend time around bodies of water, maybe lake, maybe ocean, have probably noticed that they can be really variable over space and time. So for example here, Variable density and presence of phytoplankton has resulted in areas of relatively higher or lower chlorophyll A. Conductivity of stream inflows can influence within lake conductivity, depending on variable watershed influences and flow regimes. Or lake morphometry and wind can affect water quality over space and time. For example, by controlling the movement and retention of pollen on Lake Auburn last summer, as you see here. This variability in lake water quality occurs as a result of many dynamic and interacting factors, which may be driven by some combination of biological, chemical, and physical processes. 
And of course, while some of these aspects of water quality may be clearly visible, we do require tools to be able to reliably quantify this heterogeneity occurring as a result of these various factors. Lake scientists have lots of clever ways to quantify this variability, and this toolbox continues to expand with advances in technology. Historically, variability in surface water quality and lakes has been quantified by taking measurements along and vertical profiles along transects or taking discrete water samples at different points within a lake, maybe at weekly to monthly intervals. And while these traditional limnological methods are pretty well standardized, they also require a pretty big investment of time, resources, and personnel that does limit their spatiotemporal scope. More recently, the use of static monitoring buoys equipped with in situ sensors has allowed for an expansion of the temporal scope of limnological data sets through continuous data collection from the water column. So as you see at this buoy here, we have a chain of sensors that are measuring temperature and dissolved oxygen from the surface of the water all the way down to the bottom at 36 meters. However, this type of buoy cannot measure spatial heterogeneity that's occurring across the horizontal dimension of a lake surface, only the vertical dimension. The analysis of satellite imagery using methods in remote sensing does give us the ability to detect broad spatial changes occurring at the lake scale over time. But what can be understood about the lake through satellite imagery is also limited by timing of satellite flyovers, cloud cover that limits our ability to see the, the image, sensor resolution, and also the development of algorithms to translate what you're seeing in the image to what's actually going on in the lake. Autonomous surface vehicles, which I'll be referring to as ASVs, can address some of the shortcomings associated with static monitoring locations and remote sensing, because these can move across lake regions to collect continuous data using onboard high frequency sensors. Successes in the application of ASVs is still um, Sorry, successes in the application of ASV technology to questions of water quality, among other things, have been documented pretty well in coastal and oceanic environments. But for inland waters, the use of ASVs is still largely in development. So our robotics colleagues at Dartmouth, who are co-authors on this work, Mingi, Alberto, Monica, and Cavito, that you see on the bottom right, designed and built Catabot, which is the ASV that you see here. Catabot is the combination of catamaran and robot. Um, and this ASV is built on pontoons and has battery powered trolling motors on either side of the boat. It's equipped with GPS, compass, sonar, and cameras, as well as the YSI XO2 multi-parameter SON that you see on the front. Um, which is, has been installed so that its probes are at half a meter depth. So we're measuring really surface patterns. And this sonde is going to be able to measure chlorophyll, conductivity, dissolved oxygen, pH, temperature, and turbidity. This ASV, the Catabot, is capable of moving autonomously based on a preset deployment plan or it can also be controlled manually using a remote controller. So we were really excited to get the Catabot deployed to see what new information we might be able to learn about both spatial and temporal heterogeneity in our study systems. As a group, we happen to have this suite of lakes across New Hampshire and Maine that span a gradient of trophic states sizes, and nutrient inputs. So this sets up a really nice opportunity to test Catabot in a range of environments. 
So Lake Sunapee in New Hampshire that you see on the far left is this super clear water lake with generally low phytoplankton biomass. Next, Lake Auburn um, has had historically excellent water quality and is actually our unfiltered drinking water source for Lewiston and Auburn. China Lake, a bit further north, is much greener than Lake Auburn and experiences regular cyanobacterial blooms. And then Sabatis Pond on the far right is clearly the greenest, even by the Google Earth image here. Um, it's a very shallow system with a maximum depth of, of about five meters. So it gets very warm in the summer um, and has reliably has thick, scummy cyanobacterial blooms through the summer and fall. So our goal is to find out what we could learn about within and across lake variability using this new technology, the Catabot. First, we needed to evaluate whether Catabot collected data sets were limnologically reliable. And then we wanted to figure out what new information Catabot might be able to reveal about spatial and temporal heterogeneity that we might not otherwise be able to observe using traditional methods. So addressing these questions was really a collaborative undertaking that necessitated lots of work across disciplines and institutions. <coughs> so locations for Catabot data collection were informed by preset deployment paths that we designed using the Mission Planner open source software um, and we designed these paths in areas that we knew from prior knowledge were going to be maybe the most variable parts of the lake or had some other interesting factor um, based on prior knowledge. So in an ideal world, maybe we could have deployed the Catabot to cover in great detail this whole lake system. Um, but in practice, this would first of all exceed the Catabot's three and a half hour <coughs> battery life um, but also be difficult to interpret differences in space for parameters that also change as the day progresses. Um, so therefore we kind of had two types of paths that fit within that three and a half hour time window that was practical for us. Lawnmower style paths we used for more detailed coverage of a smaller area. And then we use these transect style paths for less detailed coverage of a much larger area. So depending on what questions we had. So for example, at Lake Auburn, um, which you see on the left, water quality is affected by nutrients entering the lake via a tributary inflow in this area. So we designed a lawnmower style path to cover that whole cove. And then at Sabatis Pond on the right, um, the pond was experiencing a bloom at the time of ASD deployment. And so we chose this 10 kilometer transect style path to explore bloom development and patchiness across the whole lake. Along each design path, the YSI XO2 multi-parameter SANS installed on the Catabot measured these six different water quality parameters in one second intervals over predefined trajectories that included both continuous motion and two minute loiter pauses over specified areas. So here you can see those planned um, paths in yellow. In yellow is where the ASV would move continuously. And then in green, you can see the 120 second, two minute loiter pauses, which have been spaced throughout the ASV path. Um, so in this video, you can see the Catabot during a loiter on China Lake last year. You can see when the Catabot stops movement, um, reaching a loiter location. And then once it's at that loiter location, it just makes small adjustments to stay in place for that two minute period. These loiter pauses were included throughout all deployments as a way to ensure some opportunities to 
allow the sensors on the multi-parameter sound sufficient time to um, equilibrate on a particular reading. Because while we did expect continuous motion might have an influence on these sensor readings, we wanted to definitely determine kind of how severe of an impact that would be so that we could understand how to interpret this type of data stream moving forward. So now for some results. So here you can see a path that's showing pH data collected by the Catabot during a fall 2021 deployment on China Lake. And what you might be able to see um, are these heightened readings for pH that correspond to where these white numbers are placed along the path. So as you might have guessed, those numbers correspond to those 120 second loiter pauses that were included within this path. Um, and so you do see these heightened readings. The plot on the right shows the same data, but it's as a time series with the speed shown in gray scale. So the lighter the gray scale here, the lower the speed. And you can see that in these periods of slower speeds, we consistently see these heightened pH readings from the sensor. And you'll notice that the change is not huge. It's only about 0.1 to 0.2 pH units. Um, but the fact that it's consistent um, means that we definitely are noticing this pattern. And to give you an idea of the magnitude and the prevalence of this travel artifact that we observed, this plot shows changes in the sound pH reading during loiter pauses versus movement, but for all lakes and deployment dates. So you can see our four study lakes are color coded on the bottom. Um, they're now in order of trophic state with Lake Sunapee and Lake Auburn being our relatively clear water um, systems with very low phytoplankton biomass and China Lake and Sabattis Pond being much more eutrophic, productive, greener systems. So for pH, you can see that all effects of travel did fall within the range of error of the pH sensor itself, which means that for pH, we can, pretty, uh, we can count on that reading as being pretty re reliable, even during continuous motion of the catabot. And similarly, for specific conductance, differences in sensor readings fell mostly within the range of error for the sensor. So again, we can rely on that measurement. For the most part, dissolved oxygen could also be reliably measured on a moving platform. But notice that we are starting to see more of these points start to creep outside of the range of error for that sensor. And finally, for turbidity, we see large differences between sensor readings when the catabot was moving versus when it was stopped at a litter location. And interestingly, we also see that in instances where these travel artifacts in sensor readings did exceed the range of error of a particular sensor, um, this typically occurred in eutrophic systems. So you can see those green points and those red points for China Lake and Sabattis Pond are typically the only ones that are falling outside of that range of error. So while we conclude that the effect of continuous motion on sound readings was generally small and occurred only for certain sensors, we should definitely remember that some parameters, especially turbidity, could vary up to two whole units when the ASV is moving versus stopped. So for those of us typically used to collecting data with a high level of precision, this is just something to be aware of. After noticing these occasional travel artifacts, we wondered if they would impact our ability to locate real peaks and real patterns in the ASV data. 
However, we were encouraged to see that while we did observe these heightened readings at the loiter points in each corner, as you see here, they did not affect the ability of the catabot to detect real hotspots at very localized scales. So for example, here, we're still on China Lake in August of last year. We saw a couple of localized areas of relatively higher chlorophyll. And so these are really interesting and could be indicative of patchy phytoplankton growth in this area. And last August also, but now at Lake Auburn, in addition to maybe a possible pattern in pH related to proximity to shoreline, the catabot also revealed this small area of relatively higher pH. We saw that dissolved oxygen readings were also higher, right in the same area, which suggests that this difference could be related to productivity. And actually, upon further investigation, it did become clear that this area was characterized by a small rock island, which is home to lots of water birds. Whenever we drive the boat past them, um, you know, they all fly away, and there's about 40 of them in the air. So therefore, it's totally possible that excrement by these birds is contributing to a higher nutrient load for primary production in that small area near the island. Now I'll share a bit about what we learned about larger scale spatial heterogeneity through some of our ASV deployments last summer. So first I'll show you an example of some of the data we collected using on the top there, a transect style path at Sabatis Pond. And then on the bottom, a lawnmower style pattern on Lake Auburn. So remember Sabatis Pond is the really green one, Lake Auburn has, is a drinking water source and has really good water quality. So while both of these ASB deployments were conducted within the same week in late August, we see that water temperature is quite a bit higher at Sabatis than it is at Auburn. And we also see a smaller area of lower temperature at Lake Auburn in that upper left corner. So Sabatis Pond is shallow, it has a maximum depth of five meters, and so it really does sort of warm up quickly like a bathtub. Um, which is one of the reasons why it's so eutrophic and can experience such intense cyanobacterial blooms. So the ASV really highlighted that across lake difference in this week. We can also see that chlorophyll, like temperature, is much higher at Sabatis Pond than it is at Pond. There's a large river that comes in, um, and during this particular time period, that river was kind of serving as a way to dilute the phytoplankton in the lake. Um, and so the clear, relatively clear water from the river was flowing into the lake and making that north end of the lake a little bit um, better clarity. And then this relatively lower turbidity that we see at the southwest end of Sabatis Pond could indicate changes in spatial heterogeneity driven by wind which was coming out of the southwest during that deployment. So we could see um, some turbidity and some chlorophyll kind of moving toward that eastern shore from that southwest wind. Um, and yeah, and then we see at first for Lake Auburn, um, maybe if we squint a little bit of a higher turbidity closer to the shoreline, at the top of the map than farther out into the lake at the bottom of the map. Um, this is a pattern that we've seen before and does make sense because there's a pretty major roadway that travels right along that shoreline at Lake Auburn. Um, so it's certainly possible that erosion of sediments and other things um, by that road is, are all kind of making their way into the lake at that point. And lastly, I'm showing patterns in specific conductance, which we can see varies widely at Sabatis Pond, and is higher in one small area at Lake Auburn. So does anyone remember what feature is in the lake 
right near that high point of conductivity in Lake Auburn. Tell, tell, tell it to yourself, I guess. Um, so that's that small island, right, that's covered in birds all the time. Yep, so it's totally possible that these birds are disturbing sediment and also producing excrement that could affect the specific conductance of the water in that local area around the island. So as a whole here, we found that the catabot was capable of revealing spatial variability in multiple different water quality parameters for these two systems and path designs. And we would have been really likely to miss these transitional patterns or some of these hot spots that we saw using other methods. And so that really means that the catabot was able to uncover new information about, uh, information about these systems that we otherwise wouldn't have observed. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit over to Lake Sunapee. These are data that were collected throughout the season at Lake Sunapee last year. And this actually ended up being one of our most meaningful results from the field <coughs> campaign that we conducted last summer. So remember that Lake Sunapee was the clearest lake of the four, um, the best water quality, the most oligotrophic. So the Dartmouth Robotics Lab ran the same catabot path regularly throughout the whole season. And then when we were all looking at the data last winter, um, we noticed really how cool this time series was. We were able to observe temporal and spatial changes in specific conductance. And throughout this season, you might notice that the highest readings for specific conductance consistently originate around the similar similar locations within these two coves of Lake Sunapee. And these origin points of higher specific conductance happen to be related to the locations of tributary inflows entering the lake. So the smaller map on the right shows the ASV deployment area in the white box. And you can also see these green diamonds and those indicate the locations of different tributary inflows in these two coves. The darker the shading of green on the diamond, the higher the specific conductance of the stream um, within that tributary on average over the long term. So the two streams in the cove um, on the bottom of the map there, in particular, have very high specific conductance. And so throughout the season here, you can see that that lower cove um, did have higher specific conductance in general than that cove on the northwest. Um, so that's to be expected. So throughout the year, that cove had higher conductivity. But of course, there's this one date, especially on July 22nd, that middle box there, where both coves had extremely high specific conductance um, relative to the rest of the season. And this probably occurred because there was a pretty significant dry period in early July to mid-July, and then a lot of um, rain in kind of right before they did that path on July 22nd. And so that finding was really exciting to us because it suggests that we can use ASVs to identify and monitor loading events from the surrounding watershed into the lake. So we see kind of this pulse of, stu of stuff coming into the lake from the surrounding watershed at that time. And if, it's, if those pulses from the tributaries are bringing higher conductivity water into the lake, of course, it's completely possible that they're also bringing in higher nutrient water or other um, pollutants from the surrounding watershed that could be coming into the lake as well. So this potential to track watershed loading events to the lake using Catabot made us really excited to extend this work this year during our 2022 field season. Um, and I have not processed all of the data that we collected this season yet, but I will be able to show you some brand new data that I just pulled together from this year. 
We put a lot of effort this year into deploying the Catabot on Lake Auburn um, because again, that's a municipal drinking water source. And in particular here, there is an inflow called Townsend Brook um, where you see this lawnmower path. And this drains a commercial area that has a lot of impervious surfaces. It has a nursery, lots of car dealerships. So it's a pretty high impact stream for the lake's water quality. We've been especially eager to see the ASD results from this season because we observed this very drastic and surprising decline in water quality beginning in late July of this year. So SECI disk depth, which is a measure of water transparency and clarity, started off extremely high early in the season. Um, in mid-July, we were able to see over 12 meters into the water, which is pretty, some pretty clear water. However, then we see this rapid decline in SECI depth from late July through until now in September. So right now, when we went out last week, Secchi is currently hovering around three and a half meters. That's extremely low for this system. So we're wondering, pulling this data together from this year, was Catabot able to pick up the same trend that we've seen with the Secchi? So we see that chlorophyll concentrations change throughout the season and that these changes corresponded to this quick decline in Secchi disk depth that we observed. Secchi was high throughout the deployment on, through the deployment on July 18th, and then rapidly dropped in late July and early August, after which we start to see um, chlorophyll creep up and get higher and higher until the end of August. Before I move on, maybe some of you are wondering what the heck happened to the Catabot from, from August 12th on. Um, so in August, our autonomous robot became a manual robot um, when our collaborators needed to use the equipment for another project. And so in order to keep our time series going, um, we actually just found some spare robot parts and put them in our 14-foot fishing boat. And we just drove around <laughs> trying to keep on the lines of this lawnmower path, which was a real team building exercise. <laughs> um, although I will say we got pretty good uh, for August 29th right there. So the ASB allowed us to conclude that this rapid decline in Secchi depth corresponded to a pretty big increase in lake chlorophyll concentrations. We wanted to take that one step further to ask if other water quality parameters also collected by the Catabot could help elucidate potential drivers of that big temporal change that we observed. So in particular, we had observed an influence of precipitation on the change in Secchi depth, with the highest Secchi depth readings occurring during a long period of drought through um, late July, and the decline beginning right after a large rain event that <coughs> happened um, at the, the last week of July. So we wanted to see if our ASV data stream could help us understand the influence of tributary inflows to the lake during this precipitation change. First, we looked at turbidity patterns, and we can see a couple of things here. First, we generally see lower turbidity when Secchi was high and chlorophyll was low, the beginning of the season. And then we see higher turbidity with the drop in Secchi depth and increasing chlorophyll <coughs> concentrations. However, what we really see that's notable here is this huge increase in turbidity in this cove following the period of heavy rain at the last week of July. So in that middle panel for August 12th, um, the turbidity is actually off the the scale here, it ranges from 0.9 to 1.6 in that area, which is extremely high compared to the other dates. Um, so that's definitely an indicator that this chlorophyll change could be linked to precipitation events and tributary inflows. 
We also do see some instances where turbidity is higher near the shoreline than it is in the pelagic areas, um, which, is, which is the same thing that we saw last year in the same area. And we also see um, this area that has a potential to contribute higher sediment loads to this cove area that we really didn't realize was having such an impact. So there is a very small stream that flows in right where these blue arrows are. And um, that will definitely, we'll need to consider that further and maybe spend some more time in that area to figure out how that is influencing the rest of the cove. Another water quality parameter that may be an indicator of stream and surface runoff is specific conductance. Um, that's as we observed last year in Lake Sunapee related to those um, high conductivity inflows. This year at Lake Auburn, we noticed a couple of things. First, this general trend of increasing conductivity over the course of the summer season is typical in many lakes as evaporation increases and water level drops over the summer months. And then in terms of spatial patterns, we can see evidence of tributary inflow on certain deployment dates. So the red arrow shows the location of this major tributary to Lake Auburn. And we can see some signal of water from this tributary entering the lake on several deployment dates. Notably, this pulse um, on June 28th, that's all red in, in the sea of blue, followed a pretty significant rain event just the day before. And then we can see, just as we saw for turbidity, on August 12th, after a period of drought and then a big storm, we again see potential signals of tributary inflow um, in specific conductance. So a take home for me looking at these data is that our ability to catch watershed loading events really depends on the timing of our ASV deployments. So in some of these instances, we probably missed some of the big pulses by waiting until several days after a rain event to take the robot out. And lastly, I'm going to show you Catabot data for dissolved oxygen and pH on the same deployment dates. So this is dissolved oxygen readings. We can see high dissolved oxygen following spring mixing. And then we can see its gradual decline until chlorophyll concentrations became very high at the end of August. There are a couple of other interesting things to note here in terms of spatial patterns. First, there's this area at the top right of the cove that seems to be um, have consistently lower oxygen than the rest of this general area. And then we also see a clear pattern of relatively lower dissolved oxygen along the whole shoreline by late August. And without looking at some of our other data streams, I'm not totally sure about the cause of these spatial patterns. But what it looks like to me is that there could be some decomposition and detrital processing happening at these near shore areas. And we see one more pattern here. So remember those islands with the bird populations. Um, we do see little hot spots where that island is, again, for higher um, dissolved oxygen, like we saw last year. pH patterns were associated with dissolved oxygen in space and time. And this is expected because the process of photosynthesis influences the pH of the water. Again, we see this late summer pattern of relatively lower pH closer to shore. So maybe again, it's maybe respiration by microbes that are um, working on decomposing some material. And next, I definitely am excited to use some of our other data streams, including in situ sensors that we have in these areas um, and information from our weekly lake sampling to help contextualize some of these spatial patterns that we've seen in Lake Auburn this year. But for sure, we can see the incredible potential of the Catabot to reveal spatial and temporal patterns 
that we really would not otherwise have been able to observe in this code. And we've even been able to, using the ASV, identify some areas where we might want to start collecting additional data. Overall, we conclude that an ASV equipped with a multi-parameter sonde revealed spatial and temporal patterns related to lake water quality. And the ASV could detect heterogeneity in lake surface waters at very localized scales and across broader scales, um, both within and across lakes. We did find some evidence of the influence of continuous ASV motion on onboard sensor readings, but these artifacts were usually small and did not inhibit the ability of the ASV to reveal areas of true heterogeneity as well. And we also learned that ASVs can be very useful for capturing watershed loading events near lake inflows, um, but probably the timing of deployments really impacts our ability to be able to pick those up. So thank you so much for your interest and spending this time with me and you can feel free to contact me with any questions about this work. Can you hear me? So, um, thank you, Dr. Arsno, for the, that great talk. Um, we will take questions. Um, for those people watching online, um, you can text questions into the chat, and we can uh, monitor those and ask those questions also. So our first question's in the back. Hold on. Hello. Hi. So you said that the chatterbot is used on uh, lakes and oceans. Do you think maybe in the future they'd be able, be able to do rivers, or uh, does the water movement kind of hinder with uh, analyzing data that's moving that fast? That's a great question, thank you. Yeah, so actually um, this summer, for the first time we did deploy the Catabot in a river. So if you remember on Sabatis Pond, um, at the north end, there's that big river inflow that kind of dilutes the water in the north end and makes it a little more clear. Um, and this summer, that river was experiencing a phytoplankton bloom of its own. So it was behaving really differently than normal. So we did take the catabot up there this summer and it was really cool to see that river to lake kind of gradient. So that's a great idea and question. We have a question over here. Hello. Hi. Um, so I know that dam removal is starting to become a hot topic across Maine and all of our waterways. Are you and your colleagues interested in monitoring these types of parameters as our waterways start to open back up? Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that would be a great application of this technology to see kind of these continuous impacts and potential like subtler impacts that you might be able to see by monitoring certain stations. Or something. Yeah, absolutely. Hi. Hi. Um, so just thinking about your picture comparisons between Lake Auburn and Sabatis, um, if Lake Auburn was able to be used recreationally, so like swimming, how do you think your findings would have changed in comparison to Sabatis Pond? Yeah, so Lake Auburn is Right, no body contact allowed. It's an unfiltered drinking water source. Um, and yet we're still seeing that, um, you know, we saw this rapid decline in water quality this year and higher chlorophyll numbers than they've seen in a while. And so I think it would only increase the heterogeneity and, and the impact that we're seeing. Um, yeah, I think the anthropogenic impact from that tributary draining a really impacted area of the watershed is extremely apparent. So, no swimming. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Hi there, thank you. Um, my question's about the, um, I don't know, sea trials, or did you find the weather limitations of the ASV? It seems like the, those ones where it's autonomously controlled, they're really straight, and yeah. I'm just thinking about the impact of wind and waves, like how, how, how windy can it be before you, it doesn't work? Yep, that's a great question. So we tried not to take it out in winds above 10 miles an hour, um, but especially Lake Auburn does get really choppy even when it doesn't seem so bad <laughs> in the watershed. Um, so it, it does a really good job in pretty choppy water. It's very stable um, and it's able to correct its path very accurately. Um, but of course that also does drain the battery much faster. So you just have to keep an eye on that. And um, we can't take it out in rain at all because even though it actually technically is waterproof, you just don't want to take a chance with all those electronics. So, <laughs> yeah. And I guess that, that too could have impacted our ability to trace those watershed loading events if we would have been out in the storm or something like that, right? In the development of your ASV, did you ground troop by doing like discrete sampling along the way? Yes, we did. Um, that was a big focus of our last year's field campaign. So we would follow the ASV um, in a boat and at the end of its two minute loiter period, we would swoop in and take a grab sample um, for chlorophyll in particular. So, you know, we found that the relationship between sond measured chlorophyll and lab extracted chlorophyll was not perfect, but it was a positive relationship, linear positive relationship. So we can definitely use those readings as a general relative measure of chlorophyll concentration. Um, so why, why do you think that turbidity and oxygen uh, concentration uh, was affected by the like how much the robot was moving? Yeah, good question. With those like comparisons for continuous motion versus the reading um, while it was in a loiter pause. Yeah, so why those particular two parameters of oxygen and turbidity? Um, we're not totally sure we have some hypotheses, but um, one thing that to note is that both the oxygen sensor and the turbidity sensor are optical. And so there could be some kind of, you know, when the robot's in movement and the water is more turbulent or maybe more light is able to penetrate the water when the robot is stationary, um, I think maybe it has something to do with the turbulence and the ability of the optical sensor to work accurately with water movement. Yeah, and especially it was in those eutrophic systems where <coughs> there's so much patchiness already and so much noise that that range of error is just going to be much bigger. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. These are all really good, by the way. Hi. Um, so you mentioned briefly in the beginning that this was part of the EPSCOR project. Yeah. Is this part of the main eDNA EPSCOR, or is it? Yeah. No, it's no. not part of the eDNA, but we do, our collaborators on this project do, some of them do also work on that project. Okay, so we yeah. are collecting some samples for that yeah, project Yeah, so well. a follow-up question was yep. going to be, do you plan, or do people plan on using the Catabot for harmful algal bloom um, monitoring when they go out and take those samples? Do you think? That's going to be like in conjunction. Yeah, definitely. So we have taken some of the eDNA samples in conjunction with robot runs. So we haven't looked at that data yet, but it will be cool to see, especially just comparing with like bulk chlorophyll numbers um, with which, which different taxa are really there. And then this season as well, we added the phycocyanin um, <laughs> sensor measurements on our robot. So we're now able to see not just chlorophyll, which is a pigment for both green algae and cyanobacteria, but a cyanobacterial specific pigment, which is the phycocyanin too. We have been seeing interesting patterns there. Awesome, thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody, for the questions. And um, I'd like to thank Dr. Arsenault for being here one last time. And our next seminar in the series um, won't be until late October. So we'll see you back in this room then. You can check our website. Thanks. <laughs>